Wir kommen noch etwas warten. Okay, nein, es ist auch so zwei. Also gestern, gestern war alle mir fast zu begonnen. Leute kommen einfach nicht so viel. Die sind selber auch toll. Sollen wir eine Minute für uns? Wie haben wir eigentlich gar nicht? That looks pretty good. Oh, I think it's on this side. Mm. No, it's all right, man. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Okay, let's start. So, welcome to the second poster demo craze. So everyone will just get about one minute to give you a quick pitch what the post or demo will be about. And we will start with this one. Oh, yeah, we can. Hello everyone, I'm Blaim Melendez and I'm presenting BAT, which is an audio events annotation tool that I have developed at Barcelona Music Audio Technologies uh, in collaboration with the MTG. As you can see in the title, it is open source and web-based and uh, it's specific to the annotation of audio events, which makes it very uh, simple and efficient and still uh, suitable for many tasks, many different annotation tasks because, because events can be uh, many different things. It also incorporates the, the possibility to uh, annotate the salience of these events, and that's all. Uh, see you in the post session. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Jan Thorsten Milder, and I'm going to present the Music Box, uh, which is a little system that allows to spatialize um, audio um, onto mobile um, devices 
thing that we've seen uh, quite often right now. Um, as probably a, a point what you might be interested in is that I'm uh, developed uh, developed a little microphone array that allows to identify the direction uh, where the sound is coming from. Therefore, the spatialization is a bit more controlled. And um, my ultimate goal is to put everything on a small machine because. Um, I've seen that very many musicians are using their very expensive laptops in, in order to, to do uh, work with the, um, uh, their presentation installations. And I, I would love to have a, a system that is cheap and therefore I, I try to use the Raspberry Pi um, and as a center and um, turn it into an open access point. That is, you don't need any other hardware, you just put the Pi there and the system is up and running. Okay, just one word. Thank you for, to, to the reviewers. Uh, I get, got very, very good comments, uh, a very good and precise analysis, and, and, and this was very helpful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Donovan from Northwestern University. And basically the idea here is that you know, we talk about timbre of sound using natural language descriptors. If I told you something sounds warm or bright or sounds like it's underwater, you probably have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. But if you told the layperson to you know, open up Pro Tools Equalizer and make it sound like it's underwater, how are they going to do that? There's no underwater knob. So what we've done is um, made a web audio node that allows users to control equal equalization and reverberation effects using a crowdsourced vocabulary of mappings from natural language descriptors to effect parameters. So check out the poster. Today morning we had the talk about the um, track switch and this is a quite similar approach where we try to simplify the interaction between uh, JavaScript and HTML and translate the Web Audio API into custom HTML elements. Um, yeah, come to the poster, to a little demo and let's talk about pros and cons. Hello, I'm uh, Thomas Wilmering here from Queen Mary University and um, we have a poster about a project where we want to build uh, new tools for, to explore and discover uh, archives of live music. Uh, and we, we use semantic web technologies, uh, linked data and uh, semantic audio techniques, uh, audio analysis. And as a use case, we use the Grateful Dead uh, collection from the live music archive. Uh, because we found it quite interesting that there are, we have that 10,000 recordings on 2,000 dates, and we want to make a very targeted application for this fan base of of this particular band. And the goal is to have a web application in the end. And um, yeah, we have a poster, so I hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Tony Wallace from Irden Creative. Um, today I'm demoing the development progress on version 2 of my WebXOX uh, drum machine project. Uh, this is not only um, a ground up rebuild and redesign of it, but it's also a little bit of a rethink of how the 808-909 style uh, sequencer can work. You might be able to work when you don't have uh, hardware limitations and hardware UI limitations that we normally think of. Um, so there's quite a lot here to play with beyond what's actually shown in the screenshot, so uh, come and check it out. Thanks. Not here? Okay. So this is probably a very nice poster. <laughs> um, they are very colorful, a very colorful spectrogram. I like the color map a lot. And very aesthetic web page design, so it's probably uh, worth checking it out. <laughs> and this one is also a note here. I've just seen them setting up. All right, so they... I mean, you've seen a little bit about this already yesterday, yeah? So, yeah, another demo of what you've seen yesterday, and this one. Hi, my name is Parham. I'm part of a team of three working on RTSFX project here at Queen Mary. So, what we do is we implement um, uh, sound effects real-time in the browser using JavaScript, the audio API, uh, there are models from several sources. We've adapted them and implemented them in JavaScript. We also use the 
uh, interface elements such as Nexus, which some of you might have seen already yesterday. Um, so yeah, so we have a demo with a bunch of selected sound effects that we thought would be cool to demo. So come and look. I am Florian from Queen Mary 2. Um, so what we're showing today is a tool to explore musical performances online and especially musical expressivity. And it's based on audio source separation. So we actually separate uh, piano recordings of classical music into individual notes and then reassemble them using a framework that we built that uses the Web Audio API uh, directly in the browser. And so what you can do is you can deform uh, the music as you're playing it back and add expressivity and remove expressivity, for example, in all uh, musical parameters independently. And you can also blend different uh, performances into each other and several other things, spatialize uh, the performances regarding certain musical aspects and so on. So just stop by if you're interested. All right, yeah, I think that's it. So uh, we can start the session whenever we want, but I mean, it's scheduled for in five minutes, so we're still good in time. Um, So, I hope it's working. Okay. Um, So uh, now I want to introduce uh, the project Sound Color Space uh, Virtual Museum. Um, the project is situated at uh, Zurich University of the Arts and was founded by the Swiss National Foundation. Uh, so for the introduction, the Sound Color Space does not mean uh, intermedial performances. Instead it, instead, it investigates the field of musicology and historic music theory, acoustics and optics, and their uh, visualizations through geometrical concepts, so uh, diagrams, so to say. And you, you see examples. These pictures are interesting because of their 
diagrammatic structure as well as how they combine text, images and spatial structures. They also have a cultural and aesthetic value. And um, most of the diagrams uh, deal with uh, music theory of this time and also uh, other diagrams deal with optics and also it was uh, common in this time to make relation between optics and sound. And also there are diagrams uh, from the recent time and the project explores the adequate modes of representation of this content and also uh, re uh, research the content itself. So the application, we called it a virtual museum and it consists of uh, basically of three parts the archive, and there is um, there are exhibitions, and there is a, a virtual lab where we um, provide interactive examples. The archive is closely related to the media archive at uh, Zurich University of the Arts. Um, in the database of the media archive, the scientists can add material with related meta, meta information. Um, the media archive already has advanced interface for, for adding meta information. And so the meta, virtual museum uses the media archives API to synchronize this material with their own database. Uh, additionally, the users uh, access the archive of the virtual museum through a separate interface uh, which uh, involving special searching, sorting and viewing features which are not available in the media archive. Besides the archive, uh, the content, uh, the access to its contents, um, besides the archive, there are, um, as I mentioned, the exhibitions um, this is part of the museum and the exhibitions we interpret as a, a network of information and this network of information is presented by an operative image, we call it operative image and has a diagrammatical structure itself. So this concept leads naturally to a navigation tool. Um, our realization of an exhibition also resembles a museum tool. For example, this is like an, you can uh, go from page to page like a round trip. Um, here is another example with a different realization. Um, we also created a timeline of the exhibits, uh, which is also very helpful to get an overview. Um, the virtual lab, in the virtual lab we created interactive examples. Uh, These interactive exhibits are programmed in P5GS, a JavaScript library of processing organization which offers the same functionality as processing. So the reasons were because many of the media arts and media artists and also the uh, musicologists are familiar um, used as they, they are familiar with, with processing and so we we've went the way that uh, the musicologists uh, programmed it in processing and we implemented it uh, for in JavaScript in P5.js for the web. So there are some adjustments necessary, but basically it works. So for this experiment, uh, we used uh, different strategies. Uh, existing pitch diagrams were made audible 
through web audio so that they can be used for demonstration or education. Other examples generate new diagrams which help to compare, for example, musical scales uh, defined by different authors. Other examples create a graphical template of the scales under consideration which can be compared with the historic diagrams. So the final, um, uh, the final application consists of two parts, a layer in which the interactive diagram is generated, the separate layer where the settings and the synthesizer is placed. So the capabilities of the existing P5 sound library was not suitable and we developed, developed a simple synthesizer based on uh, web audio. Um, so this is also a work in progress and uh, we want to improve the functionality but also it will, will be necessary to make it more accessible uh, for musicologists because um, they are not interested in to make ma many settings so we, uh, we want to develop uh, presets that uh, uh, will be helpful for them. So here is another example. So this, so basically the spiral uh, uh, represents uh, scales and on the, the left there is a syntonic gutter. It means that uh, the intervals in the horizontal are the fifth and in the vertical is the third. So the um, series of the time um, was um, there were man many different uh, scales and series but because uh, the, the, the fifth and the third were uh, very important intervals, uh, so this gutter is very helpful to understand the scales. So by, beside this um, use case, uh, we also used it in interactive audiovisual performances. We have uh, used an early version of the cloud speakers, which I presented in a demo yesterday. In uh, Blade the Descartes, uh, the diagram was used as a controller interface in the browser of the mobile devices. The cloud speakers are using Raspberry Pis connect connected to a local network. They are running a Super Collider server. Um, for the performance, we used also web audio directly from the devices and the interface and additionally the output of the cloud speakers, uh, which were freely distributed in the room. So, for the developments, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want to extend the functionality of, of the synthesizer and make presets. Also, for me, it would be nice to have an option to use MIDI so now it's already possible to use OSC, so it's sending OSC data um, so to, uh, to WebSocket, to, for example, Super Collider. But um, with MIDI, for, for example, it can, could be useful to, uh, to try the scales. Also, maybe it uh, could be a tool where different scales are tuned with MIDI. So can, you can use it, for example, with performances. Um, so I'm at the end of the presentation. I can maybe give you a simple. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can make a simple. So how it works with the interface, but I don't know yet where it is. That's a little bit too. So this, so now I can uh, 
Yes, it's not possible now. Better, but it works like that way that the, the user can just uh, click the points and, and hear the scales. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Raymond, for a nice presentation. And now, um, are there any questions in the room for the speaker? Yes. Well, I have a question. What? I have a question. Yes. So I wonder uh, whether your platform could accommodate the artworks uh, of Web Audio Conference um, or particular ones. So the, the main uh, focus of the project was not uh, to develop these examples. It was about the, the diagrams. So it was just. Um, so I want to m make developments and with performances. So it's my own uh, interest to develop those. But, uh, for this project, so I think it's uh, more like the database is important. Any more questions? Yes. So, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, do, do you have several like interactive tools or interactive exhibits in in this um, in, in 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 this um, exhibit? Do you have several interactive um, like you have the interactive audio um, scales you built? Are there more different interactive things in this? Um, yes, uh, there are some uh, examples which were built from another uh, musicologist. Um, there are quite many examples, but they were, uh, were built in, in Flash, so uh, we didn't want to build it in Flash, but uh, they are quite interesting and very uh, many examples. Any more questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker. And now let's welcome Sebastian Zima, presenting a modern approach to assess loudness and dynamics with web audio native nodes. But the title here. Maintaining the loudness piece with web audio. All right. Um, hi, I'm Sebastian, and I want to talk about um, how to maintain the loudness piece with web audio. First, a bit about uh, myself. Um, I'm working at the Cologne Center for eHumanities, which is a DH center at the University of Cologne. And I have this blog called Web Audio Tech. Um, my love for web audio started in 2012 with this quite silly and limited synthesizer, which I made for a university assignment. And it went on with my master thesis, where I developed this web app called BeatSketch, where you can collaboratively uh, create tracks with uh, predefined sample-based instruments. So it was all about music, and so it is today. I want to talk about loudness and dynamics today, and I think it's well known that the loudness war or the loudness wars are over, and um, that's because of online streaming services like YouTube or Spotify, which have implemented um, loudness normalization features. And to maintain this loudness piece, we music producers must act like pacifists that master their music with the right amount of dynamic range. Mastering your song too loud will result in quite a playback, um, so that listeners will perceive your music as inferior compared to other tracks, because it lacks dynamics. And the same happens when you don't master loud enough. So turning it up to 11 is not an option anymore when mastering digital audio. And in this day and age, uh, music production is available to everyone with a laptop. Tools that support us in our peaceful attitude um, 
should be widely available too. Um, an internationally agreed uh, method on measuring loudness is the EBU recommendation R128. It introduces some new units such as the loudness unit or the loudness unit uh, relative to full scale or the decibels relative to true peak. These loudness units take into account that uh, human ears uh, are more sensitive to some frequency ranges uh, than others. And this is achieved by some filtering algorithms. R128 also defines time spans uh, over which you can measure loudness. There's the integrated loudness for a whole audio program, or there's the short-term loudness for the last three seconds of a audio track, and the momentary loudness um, for the last 400 milliseconds. And in addition, two more measuring units have popped up that are based on the EBU R128 units. Uh, I think these units were being first used by uh, a plugin called Dynameter by Meterplot, which is a DAW plugin. And these units are called PSR, which is peak to short term loudness ratio, and PLR, which is peak to integrated loudness ratio. And they have proven to be quite um, useful and convenient when it comes to mastering music because they intuitively uh, indicate how dynamic the music is at the moment, as well as overall. And you can obtain them by just subtracting um, the, subtracting the um, short-term loudness ratio from the true peak, or the integrated loudness ratio um, from tr true peak. But how to get um, web audio to compute all these values? The first thing I noticed um, when I looked at the algorithm specifications in this ITU tech doc was that the filters were defined only by filter coefficients um, for a sample rate for 48 kilohertz. So I could either use uh, Web Audio's IIR filter node interface or trying to um, deduce the frequency Q and gain values to be able to use a bicord filter node um, to be sample rate independent. I decided for the latter just because Web Audio made this very easy because of uh, the method get frequency response, which is available in both the IIR filter node interface and the bicord filter node interface. Dear spec editors, thank you for this. So I had implemented the filters, uh, but how to uh, get the rest of these, um, how to do the rest of these calculations? Well, it turns out that you do not need script processor for um, or audio workload or custom DSP code for everything. For example, you can square a signal and its sample values not only with a JavaScript math function, but also with a simple gain node. You have to just connect the input to the node itself as well as to its gain parameter. Or you can get the square root of a signal um, by using a wave shaper node and an appropriate curve. And you can sum sim single uh, sample values by doing a convolution, by, doing, by using a convolver node with the right impulse response. In this case, uh, the impulse response has a constant value of one for uh, three seconds. And by the way, I love how short this uh, fetch and promise syntax is nowadays. Um, yeah, in the end, I, after I had uh, the algorithm implemented completely, the audio graph rendered by Firefox DevTools looked like this. You can see how uh, the gain nodes are connected twice to other gain nodes. And um, at the end, there's no more real audio data going uh, through the nodes, but more like uh, measuring data. So you, you would not listen to what comes out of the gain node at the right. All right, let's look at a web app um, that I have created. It's called Loudev, and uh, it should provide music producers as well as music lovers with a tool that gives you an assessment of your track. Let's test it with a song. How do I get out of full screen mode? 
Ah, det. So this will take a few seconds because there are some workers at work and I hope we will finish in three, two, one. Yeah, there it is. So what do we see here? Um, we see the waveform at the top um, and further down we uh, see a two-dimensional loudness map and then you see here this colorful thing. Um, it's a map of the peak to short-term loudness ratios over time. Um, and these values are mapped to colors, uh, where greener colors uh, symbolize a more appropriate dynamic range, and red color tones symbolize a dynamic range which is rather low. And in this case, everything looks quite nice. Well, of course, because this track has been mastered by myself. The PLR value is also mapped to an emoji to provide another intuitive clue. And further down, we see some more measurement data um, and what Laudev makes of it. These assessments are based on my own experience with mastering as well as uh, recommendations by mastering engineer Ian Shepard. Two examples of such recommendations are keep the minimum short-term peak to loudness, the PSR of the track, always above eight loudness units so that some uh, level of dynamics is always ensured. And don't exceed minus one decibel decibel relative to true peak because otherwise re-encoding the material could result in inter-sample clipping. And here you can see um, that Laudev is a bit disappointed because I have the, because the um, true maximum true peak level in this whole song is too high. Uh, normally you would hear something but right now the audio is broken but it's not so important in this case. But uh, it depends on what you see here. All right. Um, to um, come to an end, let's. I want to show you some more screenshots of um, other songs, like this one, which is uh, by Red Hot Chili Peppers, Around the World. Um, it is a classic uh, loudness war victim. And as you can see, Laudev is quite sad about this. And uh, this is a song called Blunderbuss by Jack White. It looks quite good. Um, and the album with the same name has won the uh, Dynamic Range Day Award. Future work. Well, the assessments and um, explanations could always uh, be a bit more precise. But uh, one thing that would be great, um, I think, is to cooperate with um, online streaming services like YouTube or Spotify, because right now you don't know really what is going on with their loudness normalization algorithms. You always have to guess and measure. So it's kind of like a black box and you have to put something in and hear what comes out. So that was, would be great. All right, this was my little presentation and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sebastian. Very nice talk. So, any questions from the room? Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, quick question. Have you compared to kind of more traditional noise control uh, measures like DBA or DBC weighted? Um, no. I just took the paper, the EBU recommendation, and the two units, PSR and PLR. Thanks. Any more questions? Yes. Right. So. Once you build the, the graph that contains all the filters and all the uh, 
all the stuff. I noticed that the, the processing was offline. How did that? How did that work? Could you explain that? Oh, you mean like yeah, these values over here? Um, it's not really on the fly because at first some web workers will analyze this file uh, thoroughly and will generate values for each um, pixel here. So that's why these um, you have here running um, values for loudness and um, dynamics and true peak. No, Robert, my question was like, uh, when, when you're analyzing the audio, does that happen using the offline context or? Yeah, yeah? it does use the offline context like uh, for resampling and for the bycode filters and it also uses web workers. Right, cool. That's my question. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, so, what kind of filter shape did the filter parameters in the um, recommendation uh, prescribe? Um, there were two filters, like one high shell filter and one high pass filter. Yeah. And after that, there comes some more processing, like mean square, root mean square, or something like that. Uh, would a possible future enhancement be to automatically process the uh, signal according to the recommendations? So have, have buttons you can click on. Is, there, is that a direction you've looked at to address deficiencies in the signal? Sorry? Uh, is, is there any kind of automatic processing that you could apply to help the user, the, the, um, the, the producer or the, the, rec the person that recorded it to improve these, uh, these metrics? Um, you mean besides this assessment? So this is the assessment? Yeah. So now what do I do to make my music better? Let's oh, say. yeah. Yeah, it, ideally you would have here a recommendation what to do to make it sound better, yeah. And can that be automated? Um, I think so, yeah. Because you have some um, sweet spots for each value, ideally. And you can say, oh, this value is too high, this value is too low. And in the end you have to adjust this and this to get optimal, optimal values overall. We have time for a last question, one last question. Right. I have a, a query, I mean, I'm curious about the online context mm -hmm. and in terms of visualization, how do you see future steps? Uh, you, in the visualization? Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Well, I would be interested, so that's, okay. if there is work in the future. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Let's thank again. And now let's welcome, let me see if I say it correctly, Christophe Gutendin. Is it very correct? Very nice, very nice. Uh, <laughs> noiseless web audio tests, and let's see. The title, did it match? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hello everybody. Uh, yeah, as you already have heard, my talk is titled Noise Lab Web Audio Tests. And that's all about how to write your code in a way which allows you afterwards to test it automatically without opening up your browser every time to make sure everything sounds still as it should. And that's why I also titled my talk Continuous Deployment Without Continuous Annoyment. <coughs> but yeah, sadly, that's not an English word, so I had to invent it. And if you want to follow along the slides on your own, you can go to bit.ly WAC uh, 2017, and you will find them there. OK, here's a bit of information about myself. I'm from Berlin. Uh, I'm a web developer. And of course, I like the web audio API. And yeah, I'm usually named Chris Gotandin everywhere, so if you find me on any of the usual networks, just ping me. Okay, that's the outline of my talk. I want to first show you um, how the Web Audio API is currently most of the time polyfilled and uh, what problems that causes or why that prevents you from writing nice tests. Then I want to introduce the concept of expectation tests, which is the thing which I'm using to avoid that. And at the end, I want to uh, mention what possibilities you have once you have done all that. 
But I want to start with a little quiz. And want the question is, if that's oh, the mouse is in the way, if that's what it's source code or not. And yeah, the clever ones might already have guessed because of the link that it was well at source code in 2012. And it's not valid anymore. We don't have node on and node off uh, anymore on the audio buffer source node. So um, let's just imagine you had the web app and those two lines were part of your code base. And then after a while you realized, oh, my app does not work anymore. And you had to do something. And one approach would be to just uh, rewrite the node on method because you like it so much. And you just check if there's a node on method on your Audi buffer source node. And if it's there, you uh, use it. And if not, you just re-implement it. But of course, that's not what you want, because you want to write uh, the code from the future, which still works on the browsers from the past and not the other way around. So you flip that concept. And instead, you're patching the start method. That's essentially the same as before, just the other way around. And in this case, it looks a bit more complicated, because um, there's the node on method was split into node on and node great on, which is now all combined into the start method, but essentially it's doing the same. And many of you might have uh, noticed that piece of code because it's part of the well known audio context monkey patch, which probably all of you have used at least once. And it also contains this uh, very, very popular line, which is still used, uh, which is still in use because it's needed in Safari. There's no unprefixed audio context. And um, yeah, even if you don't use the monkey patch itself, I'm sure you use that line of code somewhere. And that's where the problem starts, where the problems are starting, in my opinion, that we are assigning something to the global scope. And that's generally something we should avoid. Of course, you kind of uh, can get away with it here, because you're assigning something which should probably be there, which is not, and you're just doing something good. But just imagine you are a web developer and you, you are coming or your script gets loaded on the same page later on and you realize, oh, there's an audio context. It must be one of the future versions because Safari, the old one, is still prefixed. And then you're using it and suddenly realize, oh, that's the one from Safari. And yeah, so that should be avoided in my opinion. And on the other hand, uh, patching the native prototype should be avoided too. So that's also, I guess, from the audio context monkey patch. Here we are uh, patching the create gain method, which was previously named create gain node. The technique is uh, totally the same as before, but we are patching the native prototype. And again, you can say that's okay because we are patching something which should be there and it's not, so we're just doing something good. But uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you remember the array contains thing, which was kind of a specification and then had to be revoked because MoTools was already implementing that method and was slightly different. So that's why we now have area includes and not area contains. So the general rule is do not patch native prototypes. And the most important thing, or the worst thing in my opinion, is that those fixes work forever. You don't have any chance to, to check if that's still necessary or not. So if you, again, it's the same technique. We're just checking if something is there. And if it's there, we use it. If not, we do it on our own. And this will work even if the get float time domain, uh, get float time domain data method is once implemented in every browser. Um, this will happily work. It will pass. It will load. And it's just dead code. So it's kind of like a memory leak in your code. And that's why I propose to use expectation tests. Whenever you patch something, whenever you try to overcome a shortcoming of a browser, write a little expectation test for it, which is actually testing the shortcoming. So here we, we are testing, create gain is not there. It should be undefined. And uh, whenever a new browser version gets released, we run this test again. And once it fails in every browser, we know, oh, now we can remove that method. And our code base gets slightly, uh, uh, slightly smaller. Of course, that depends on your policy. If you only want to uh, support the latest and greatest browser, you can remove it right away. If you have a different policy, you should wait a little bit longer, I guess. And another uh, important thing is to uh, move all the polyfill code into a separate module. I just named it Audio Context Polyfill here, but it could be named whatever you like. And all the nasty hacks which try to um, make the Audio Context work in a way which you like it to be, or which the specification is proposing it, uh, should be in there, and once you imported it and uh, use it, 
uh, you should treat it as if, it's, as if it was, would be perfect. So there should not be any browser hacks anymore in your business logic. There should all be in this area where nobody looks at. And when you've done all that, on top of it, you write an integration test for your polyfill, which makes sure that your polyfill is actually behaving uh, like it should. So we, we are not uh, checking the behavior on the patched audio context because we don't patch it anymore. We just patch it. Uh, we just check it on the polyfill. Yeah, and with that, we have a nice um, separation of concerns. So we have the business logic, which is uh, just thinking that it deals with the perfect API because. Of course, we never will have a perfect API, but from the business uh, logic perspective, it looks like. Then we have the polyfill, which takes the native implementation, does whatever it has to do with it, and passes it on to the, um, uh, to the business logic without touching the native implementation. So the native implementation should stay untouched, in my opinion. And as a bonus, if you use TypeScript, and you are using TypeScript, you write your polyfill, you actually get the types from your polyfill instead of the TypeScript types, which um, do not match the ones from your browser, of course, because TypeScript has only one type definition and we have several browsers. And yeah, if you've done all that, you can then go ahead and do the actual testing of your business logic by doing very easy things like just swapping out the audio context for an offline audio context and render the whole thing, and then compare it afterwards. That might be the, the easiest approach to test, but the hardest to actually evaluate the test results. It's more easier to mock the audio context and then check if you are calling the right methods on it. And uh, last but not least, you can also mock the current time and trigger events like on ended or things like that uh, on the audio context and make sure that your code is behaving as, you, uh, it, as you're expecting it to be. And yeah, these are the advantages. I guess I said that somehow before. But yeah, tests can be executed now with a testing framework. There's no need to manually test uh, every code change. And once the browser updates uh, gets released, you don't have to be uh, in fear that your code does not work anymore. Even though uh, even uh, you don't have to fear it, but instead, you, you are uh, happy for every update because then you can check your expectation tests and remove the code you don't need anymore. And if all that was too theoretic, uh, there's a workshop tomorrow where we try to build a super annoying web app, which uh, <laughs> that's, that should resemble one of those things you send, uh, you give children as a present if you don't like their parents, uh, where you press it on the button and then it makes a sound. And this makes super annoying sounds, and we are trying to refactor that so we have, we can change it afterwards without uh, testing it manually. So that will happen tomorrow. And that's it. Here are two links. That's the link to the famous Slack channel, which, which was mentioned so often. That that's the link if you want to join. And if you have a, ever happen to be in Berlin, come to our web audio meetup. It's very cool. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Christoph, for a nice talk. And any questions from the audience about the talk, the workshop? So I have a question. Yeah. I wonder whether this um, expectation test uh, can accommodate uh, pieces or multiple users, uh, interfaces that need to be tested for multiple users. How? Uh, you have to, to separate that for, for each browser you support because every browser behaves differently. So you have to make a suite of expectation tests for every browser you support. That's a bit tedious, but I think it's worth the effort because then you know what you're doing. <laughs> Otherwise, there's chance, of course. <coughs> Any more questions? Well, I have a second question then for tomorrow workshop. Can, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, can you explain a little bit more? Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I can go back to the slide. It's a super simple web app. And you see uh, air conditioning system on the top, uh, builder in the bottom, uh, on the bottom here, you can't see it correctly, and the truck. And they all make uh, annoying noises, I would say. And, um, 
Yeah, and if you want to, uh, if you, somebody tells you that's your new job, you have to uh, take care of that app. And now, can you please add that feature? Uh, how do you know that everything is still working as before? Just by opening up the browser and clicking on each of those items to make sure they are still making sound. And then you have to listen to it, and that's not enjoyable. So that's the, the motivation for refactoring it in a way that we don't have to listen to it anymore. We could have used anything else, but I thought it's funnier. <laughs> <laughs> Can make a second workshop and have the power to change the sound design of the application. Yeah. <laughs> it's on GitHub, you can modify it if you like. Good. Oh, there's a note. Hi, I asked you a similar question yesterday, but um, so how do you think it scales up to very complex graphs with lots and lots of nodes um, where the processing might be a bit less? Um, yeah. Uh, predictable. Well, if you have something unpredictable in your code, that's always <laughs> bad, I would say. Or, for example, it could be user, user programmed or that sort. Of. Um, yeah, I, d I don't know the exact answer to that, but I generally would advise to package everything which is possible into smaller pieces and test those and start from there. I don't know. I guess uh, that's, that's the, the truth, that there will always be things which can't be polyfilled and there will always be things which can't be manually t uh, automatically tested. So there will always be some things which you... If you never open up the browser again and uh, your tests will uh, pass for the next year, that's not really a guarantee, but it really helps to be kind of sure. It's not 100%, but nearly there. Any more questions? Okay, so let's give uh, an applause to our speaker. <laughs> We're very good on time. We're welcoming now Chase okay. Mitchinson. This is Allison presenting usage of physics engines for UI design in Nexus UI. Is it on the side? Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Get in this better option. Oh, perfect. So let's use that. Just to disconnect this. Yeah. Then you can plug in the audio from the directory. Nice. And it will be loud. Okay, I will so turn it motion. down. <laughs> Chase Mitchison from Louisiana State University. With me is Dr. Jesse Allison, also Louisiana State University. Uh, we're here to talk to you about uh, NX Physics UI, which is an addition we're working on for Nexus UI. Some research we've been doing about uh, making physics engines with uh, instruments and synthesis. So, something we can use in the browser and get a little history of Nexus UI here. Okay. 
All right. Um, so I'll just give you a quick history, uh, and then we can move on to what we actually did. But uh, this is work uh, over the last couple of years, Nexus UI, and where this uh, work came from was essentially um, we were doing web audio or web collaborative performance stuff, and we kept making these one-off user interface objects. It started in 2010, um, where the traditional standard music interfaces were just not out there. I think there was a Yahoo library that had a couple sliders and some things that, uh, so anyway, we kept remaking these things. And uh, so we kind of rolled them all together into one UI library and uh, uh, started making experimental types of interfaces, right? And uh, that we could reuse really easily. Over time, we were making experimental ones that had different things like automation, sequencing, I think that's the example that's up there, some things with uh, you know, very simple uh, echo and bouncing uh, uh, UIs, some things where we could record gestures and play them back and stuff like that. So we had some very basic types of things that could be, were headed towards physics, but um, we didn't want to re-implement it. We decided that very early on. and so. Recently, we wanted to get back into that and decided that it was time to go looking for other libraries and frameworks that were out there for the web to be able to try to integrate them with Nexus and uh, rapidly prototype some, some audio interfaces that actually had physics engines in the background. So um, just to talk really briefly about uh, the physics engine, right? So you've got maracas and you've got lots of little particles inside them and you move it and it runs into the side of the maraca and it makes a bunch of little taps, right? And I just want to make sure we're on the same page with this. It's not physical modeling. We're not actually talking to model the taps or, or the movement, but we're just using the movements to trigger events or to control map to other parameters. So more like a video game engine, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So the first of two physics engines we really looked into uh, is Matter.js. They use rigid bodies, uh, which was very appealing to us. Um, it's all in JavaScript, which is what we wanted to stick to. We were already using JavaScript with Nexus UI, and this more or less seemed like it would be perfect uh, to fit in with what we're doing. It also has physics engines that um, are separate from the rendering uh, engine. So if we wanted to use uh, P5 or 3JS or something like that for our actual um, bodies, we could still use the matter JS physics engine. Um, I'd like to mention on that, when we originally developed Nexus, the SVG objects were not out yet. So we did everything in Canvas. So okay. this, just very right. recently, we've been porting all of the interfaces over to SVG because it's a little more, uh, easy to add user interactions and all sorts of, sorts of responses, things yeah. like that. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons being able to have the physics engine separate from whatever's doing the rendering is just wonderful. So this yeah. is very appealing. Uh, the second would be Liquid Fun, which uh, was head up by Google for a while, back in 2015 at least. Um, it's a C and C++ library that has a JavaScript port. They do liquid simulation and they do particle systems, particle groups. Um, the appealing thing about this, uh, remind, well, it reminds us of the Ramaka, uh, Maraca situation here, uh, where we have particles and we can put them in a box and we can shake them. How can we uh, make this into an instrument? Um, so this was the, the second thing we looked at and um, we came up with some pretty interesting results. So. The first interface we make here is, uh, I guess, impulse driven, where we have a Newton's cradle, a very obvious example of uh, a physics toy, I suppose you could say. Uh, it's pretty intuitive when you see it and want to play with it. And it, well, let me demo it for you. How about that? I might have to turn this down, actually. Ooh, turn it up. There it is. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty simple, right? Uh, the beauty of this is that there's an element of decay involved. It just gets slower and slower, and it's not consistent, right? So if I want to learn how to play this as an instrument, I actually have to master timing it right to keep the tempo up. 
which is not easy to do, by the way. Um, but so we've set this up into, we got a little pentatonic scale up here, and then we have a diatonic scale down in the bottom. Um, we can choose different weights and sizes for them, obviously. Friction, different restitution, density. Uh, a lot of different examples of different ways you can map sound. Um, but this is sort of a realistic application of a digital instrument. It's very straightforward in how you're going to use it. Uh, unlike our next example, actually. Uh, so after we did the Newton's Cradle, we tried one with liquid fun, the elastic particles. Um, we're using three wobbly, wiggly uh, shapes here to play around in this little box, a little sandbox here, and we just bang things together and try to make music. This is very much the opposite end of the spectrum compared to the Newton's Cradle, where instead of uh, an impulse, we're getting just continuous audio. Um, also, it's going to be difficult to replicate or reproduce the actions you're doing in the system, where I can reproduce what I'm doing in a Newton's Cradle, but slamming this ball around is not going to be easy to replicate. Um, so that's a nice kind of feature where it's a lot more chaotic and you can make more aleatoric music with it. This one's a little quieter. They get gradually quieter. It's pretty nice. So you just get to smack the, uh, the particles around. It's a fun little game, really. Um, so it's sort of the opposite of the Newton's Cradle, basically. Um, so why not merge the two together, right? So we have a cloth mesh that we went back into uh, Matter.js after some slight setbacks. Uh, we started making this cloth mesh, which has elements that can be reproduced and has elements that are chaotic. Um, it's still got entropy, just like the uh, Newton's Cradle has, but it is, I guess, more wiggly and wobbly, uh, like the elastic particles. Uh, the fun thing about this one is how large we can make it. We've set up, you said, 40, 40, by, 20. 40 by 20 grid. Um, which gets some really crazy overtone sounds going on. Um, this is a simple one. Yes, this is, we're gonna keep it simple for the demo here. Um, so we're gonna set a displacement actually and then start making noises. This is the softest of them. Uh, so what's gonna happen now is when, where I move this, it's going to start changing, detuning sort of blowing in the wind. It's like a creepy Halloween sound effects <laughs> LP. I know we're all into that. One of the things that was, was tricky about this is there's so many different parameters that are being updated all the time that you could map it to just about anything or everything. Um, in this one sample is just um, overtone or yeah, basically overtones every, I believe it's every 10 hertz um, at, a, at some various starting point and then doing a, a distortion from that. Um, but it, it gets overwhelming pretty quickly. So the, the idea of, of exploring the mappings is, is incredibly important. Yeah. In this one, we found that doing displacement, so finding a rest state for the whole cloth and then being able to find what was being displaced in which directions and that sort of thing was more effective as a, as a way of uh, controlling the things. But what's fun about it is once you get it connected, then it's just you play with it. It's like a regular, or more like a, a traditional instrument than just pushing keys. Yeah. yeah. So we had some uh, issues here. Um, you may have noticed uh, I talked about liquid simulation when I was mentioning liquid fun. That was definitely why we started looking into it. Uh, we ran into uh, a couple problems with liquid fun. There are missing bindings for the JavaScript port. Um, so if anyone dares to take on uh, converting the C, C++ into a JavaScript port with all the bindings, feel free to, that would be wonderful. Uh, but because of that, we were actually low on data that we could interact with. 
so none of the collisions of the particles were accessible. Um, the particle groups were somewhat accessible, but that doesn't really give you a lot, you know. Uh, so what we had to do was basically ended up just using velocity and position of the collective shapes in the box, uh, which is not ideal really. Um, so instead of using liquid, we had to use shapes and kind of avoid collision detection, basically. So when when we started out with this, um, you know, building our own version of, of liquid fun would be not that big a deal for a one-off instrument but trying to put it into something that other people might use and may you know, have complaints about when it doesn't quite work the way they would expect it to, uh, it kind of ruled that out for us as a long-term term yeah. sort of thing. So we put, put it together and tried things out and it was fun, but I think heading forward, we're gonna have to stick with uh, the one that we can integrate a lot faster. Um, the things that are happening, basically, that we're looking forward to right now, we've got them all working and now we can actually play with it, which is fun. Um, Basically, the things we're looking at is getting that physics engine attached to other rendering engines. We've already worked with uh, attaching it to P5 and then using that inside of our, our widgets. Um, we've been working on yeah. SVG uh, attachments as well. But we could also go beyond that and just attach these physics engines to any of the DOM you know, parameters, whatever you want to have physically changing, doing yeah. things. Um, another one is exploring sensor inputs to be able to provide the energy that activates it. So instead of clicking and dragging things, actually sending in, yeah. you know, interface. Any, any new interface would be ideal for what we're trying to do here. To touch, to touch yeah. the virtual. And then the last one is um, one of the original things in, in Nexus that was so wonderful was it was just helper tools to be able to make your own experimental UIs. And as we kind of codified things, it became harder and harder to make your own and so that's sort of our next steps is, is make, opening that framework back up so that you still get all the, the benefits of, of the tools that are built for you, but it's very easy to actually be making your own physics UIs or, or others. Um, yeah. And anyway, that's what we're working on currently. So yeah. looking forward. Thank you. So if you guys have any questions, let us know. Yeah. Great, thanks for this cool project. Thank Any you. questions, suggestions for Chase? This? Oh, One in the back. <laughs> I wondered if there were some examples of this kind of interface that gives us some idea of the kind of sonic potential for these kind of things beyond the demos that you showed us today? Like, is there some inspiration that you've taken for either in the real world or in tools that already exist that you kind of would like to be able to make with this toolkit? Uh, well, one of my biggest inspirations uh, that I don't have an example of would be Rube Goldberg machines. Um, so I, I would love to make this toolkit and then start building crazy contraptions where like mouse traps are cutting things and balls are flying all over and doing wacky things. Uh, as far as the sonic potential, I mean, we can map anything we want to these objects. Um, but right now we've more just been researching what engines we're going to stick to. Uh, and I think our next steps will probably be a lot more musical oriented. So. Later on, if you ask him, he wrote a piece for uh, the Plinko. For Plinko and machine learning. And yeah. machine learning, yeah. So he was training it on where the balls would bounce and then having that controlled in various synthesis parameters. It's, yeah. it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> but fine. It's weird. Yeah. Any more questions over there? Do some at your size. Uh, Francisco from Goldsmiths. Uh, I was wondering if you have any plans for uh, maybe turn the Nexus UI into web components or maybe as React components. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit about uh, the advantages of each one, if you ever consider those. Let's see. 
Um, so we've done some tests on what it would take to get it to be, I believe we've done some implementations with the React JS side of things. It took a little couple of weeks to be able to get it to work with that. Um, the, the, the thing right now is we're trying to make a, a, the, the normal set of, of interfaces be as usable as, as quickly as possible. We've just, just been finishing up the, this SVG port and getting it all, um, anyway, it, to a decent web standard. And now we're, now we're looking forward to see how we can integrate it better with other things. But it'll definitely be that core set that integrates first, and then this, the experimental sides of things will be sort of an, another add-on of other elements you can just add into it. And those will always be behind. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a little while. Did that help answer your questions? Yeah. Yeah, hi, Petro student. Um, I wanted to know what inspired you to make that cloth mesh um, interface, and is there the possibility of making like different shapes that could create like different ranges of sound? Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, Dr. Allison worked on the cloth mesh a lot more than I did, but uh, I think seeing that we had the ability to connect particles, we're already using some particle systems, but learning how to connect particles, uh, I guess in a more limited zone, uh, we decided to take a look at what matter had to offer in, in that territory and s sort of went in that direction. I, don't know, what do you I think one of the things that intrigued me about the, that in particular, and actually the, the squishy objects one as well, was how many different points you've, of information you have and changes in points of information as it's moving, um, which you can then apply to things. But you've got to be really inventive um, because if you just apply everything as a one-to-one, -one, like like they did with the uh, Newton's Cradle, it just becomes way incredibly chaotic and not very useful. Um, so that, yeah, the inspiration behind it was it's just a fun thing to, to virtually, physically touch. Um, and then just once you attach it to something, then seeing what kinds of music you might be able to play with it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've, the last thing we've been working on is, is implementing or putting music, musical logic, like scales and chords and that sort of thing into the physics, trying to attach them in logical ways to the physics side of things, so that the motions that you do would be playing with musical ideas as opposed to just playing with a synthesis parameter. But anyway, that, that I think is next. That's fine. Any more questions? I have a question. So I wonder, in terms of the mappings, um, we've explored several mappings, um, but I wonder if have you considered applying al algorithmic um, mappings and then assess them and see what works best? And or, you know, how, how do you know these mappings are kind of the best choices? Well, we definitely did not explore that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it was on our list of to, to get to. <laughs> <laughs> now it works. <laughs> Yeah, and actually doing user tests and getting feedback on what encouraged the most play. And I mean, there's, there's a whole set of things that you yeah. I, I would say I'm not even, I'm not certain we've still made the best choices mapping wise, but I think we've made some very wise choices to start with. Um, but we learn more as we go and hopefully uh, they get better over time. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Let's thank you. Welcome again, little place. ran off with their mic here. And let's welcome our last speaker today, um, Norbert Schnell, with playing with mobile devices and web standards together. Hello, I'm Norbert Schneider from Ircom, and I don't have a screen for now. You know what we will do? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
you know, yesterday I rebooted the machine. I should have done that already. We will do that now. Yeah, it's back, but we will do that now. We will take this one minute and a half it takes. We can try once more before doing this, but I don't think it will do exactly the same. And I have no idea what it is. And yesterday it was the only way to get rid of it. But I can do the introduction while, while this would uh, be good. So, um, what I will talk to you about, uh, talk to you about, is actually, um, I will give an overview of research that went on for about four years now. Um, I had the incredible fun and luck and everything you could associate to this joyfully to coordinate a research project where we had the time and money to play with mobile phones and web audio for uh, four years. And and um, that project was COSIMA for Collaborative Situated Media. And there will be up there a little list of partners. There were people working on more on visual stuff. And we were, of course, working on sound and music. Um, and uh, a company, Orb, was working with us in this project collaboratively. Um, on scenarios on geolocated sound. Uh, and all this together made people who work together and, and shoulder on shoulder on, on the same hypothesis uh, of people um, pulling their smartphone out of their pocket more or less spontaneously and would join others to make music or to take part in an event um, and that makes graphics, being creative together. So that's the common hypothesis. Here's the little list of partners. So I will talk um, just about what we did in terms of sound and music on, on the IRCAM side of this project here today. So this is the contributions we did this year to work and audio mostly. You saw uh, Soundworks New. That was the first thing I presented here. You saw 88 Fingers uh, yesterday night, I hope. Um, you did very well. If you have, I, I wanted to play a little excerpt of the concert here today. I forgot it. Didn't prepare this, but it was really great. You know, if you think that was not musical enough or whatever, and it was not like this, it was really great. Um, you heard Benjamin um, presenting all the low frequency operators today. I will talk now about the the whole thing, and there will be a demo of an experience I will talk about in, in, in the concert on Friday in, in audio mostly. So we were exploring mobile devices, meaning, of course, smartphones, tablets, um, uh, mobile loudspeakers. I bought, I think, 100 different or maybe 50 different loudspeakers, everything you can have, and we tried them. We explored web standards, uh, plus Cordova, of course, there, we, there were the web standards. And, uh, and we experimented with audio, audience participation in all kinds of art forms and collective improvisation and uh, geolocated sound applications and all that. And finally, with uh, the technical, electrical, the technological and cultural space between performing and listening. This is what, what, is this, what we finally ended up exploring. So at the very beginning, we had to prove ourselves and the rest of the world that we can do decent interactive, so we are here in 2014, the project started end of 2013. The first thing we wanted to do is to, to, to prove to, to ourselves that you can do interactive sound, a decent, uh, uh, decent interactive sound on mobile phones, and we met people, we always met people. We did 10 lines of code and met people doing workshops and, you know, we were in the sound, Pompidou Center, we did Aircam, there are always people coming by, you can, you can gather them, people who want to know something about Aircam, they're visiting Aircam, we can say, okay, we make a, make a little workshop of half an hour and we give them smartphones, they bring their own smartphones, we visit web pages that make sound and create situations like that. And it was a lot of fun. This is another outcome, maybe you saw this, uh, it's, uh, it's old now, but I still love it. <laughs> So this is our version of, this is Robbie and Sebastian Babaskovic, who was on the project early, who, who did this. It's, it's really fun, it's, it's online, you can play with it. It's a web page with six buttons. Again, there's a lot of bass here, right? It was recorded inside the phone and then edited to the image, but it's not fake, it's real. So 
with six different little micro applications, including that one. So you can hear that the tempo is a little sluggish because in 2014 we had um, device motion uh, on a 50 milliseconds period. Today we have it on 16.666, so it's really much better. A bigger thing we did, so I will let's just uh, put out here one project after that. They're all very different, they're all in different contexts, different topologies, different so on, it's, but it's all pure web audio. Uh, but one that has a little bit of Bluetooth in, which is a core of our thing, but 99% uh, web audio. So this is a project we did with Chloe. She is a little star um, of electronic music in, in, in Paris and in, in France. And you can see her in, in, in England sometimes and in, 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 in Spain in festivals. So we did with her this concert where um, she would have four iPad uh, pods, pads, iPads integrated in her setting where she can touch them and people, the first thing that we ask them when they enter this thing is where you are approximately in space. So they have a little map, they say, mm -mm -mm, I'm here, so we know where they are. If they move, it doesn't matter, either they do it again or they just move, uh, you know, statistically, there are enough people not moving. And from there she can, at any time of the concert, um, grab these or, or touch these iPads to make sound textures, four different sound textures move over the audience, over the loudspeakers of the phones, using loudspeakers of the phones. So that's moment when she really puts down her own sound and creates kind of more poetic moments. And the other is that she can evoke on a, on a fifth kind of little, little uh, device, she can evoke little instrument interfaces on the people's phones. So they have a little instrument that doesn't look like, but it's kind of always uh, feels that you touch and they make sound. For example, the, st the, the, the concert starts with um, people playing whisper sounds. It's a phrase cut into syllables and you, you, you can put your finger so you can make it whisper and it's, it's whispering all over the place and she starts the concert into this whispering and then she will, would create over the concert three or four times moments where, the, where she really gets down the sound to something so that we can for 30 seconds, one minute, honestly, more 30 seconds, have this little moment of like a break where the sound comes from the public and there are these different sounds and she would w work in her own music with these sounds and just take it there, from there and of course there's kilowatts of sound on stage. Totally different thing. We present this is TI after having it presented several times at IRCAM at different occasions. It's um, a collaboration with the people who, who were more into visual stuff and you have this floor projection of uh, these eight pieces uh, with this cursor, which is this thing here, running around. Doom, 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 doom. And when you connect, you have on your phone an interface that has the same, you know, it's not round, but, but you can choose the notes that are played when you're standing at one of these eight places and it comes by you and the sound comes out of your phone and you determine the notes the percussion, bass, marimba notes that will be played when it's on you. So it makes you ding, 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 around and around. Uh, so you, you collaboratively um, create loops that, of course, if spontaneously it's the case, people stand around the circle, sound travels around from loudspeaker to loudspeaker. We give them, the people, little loudspeakers. And if they don't have a low-end, let's see, iOS phone, we give them one, two. Ah, here's a little video that shows. This is the real sound, right? Somebody controlling this. We kept it in whole tone scale, so it's gone nowhere. It st stays meditative, uh, dooky dooky dook uh, music for for hours and hours. Eight eight fingers. I hope you saw it yesterday. So the 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 specific the, the, the thing here is that you know I don't show you everything, but until this project from 2016, uh, created on a beer after after Sona, I guess, in Barcelona. Um, until this project, we were very excited to work with the loudspeakers of the phones because, you know, there's this distributed aspect to it. it. It really sounds great. You have immediately sound in space. People very well know what they do with the device, what they cause, because it comes out of the device. And I always had fear to control a common synthesizer coming out of loudspeakers or 
even the visual stuff, because you always end up with something that might be nice on it, but nobody knows what he or she causes in this thing. But anyway, it's interesting to do such stuff and have a really rendering device that has some energy or, or some other properties. And, and we came up with this idea, and I think it's still a good idea, even if it's hard to know what you're doing, you, you end up, I think, knowing what's your note. You know, for those who weren't there yesterday, so you, you, you claim a note at the beginning of the concert, 88 people can connect and you play this note during the concert. So it's ruleless. I say always it's a metaphor of a free and responsible society. So um, it never sounds like Mozart, of course. Um, and, and well, honestly, it's the technically a part that there is a motorized piano on stage, which is quite a complex piece of technology. The software, our part in this thing, is super, super nothing. You know, you send touch events over, over Wi-Fi, or web sockets, and the server communicates via media with piano. It's nothing. Anyway, it's it's the project. I think that is the most, the most interesting. We came up with in the whole project. It's, it's, it has something really I I love, and I loved it yesterday. I don't know how I think about it, but I really love this project. <laughs> So, totally different things. Imagine you run around um, with a mobile device, you have headphones, you hear a loop. When you are alone, you hear your loop. When you meet somebody, and uh, you can uh, control your loop with a filter. And now we have a version where you have a little drum machine, so you can create your loop with a step sequencer, little instruments. When you're alone, you're alone, but when you meet somebody, so this is a, has a cord of our extension to have Bluetooth proximity estimation in there, Bluetooth based, and if you meet somebody, you hear what she or he is doing, and she or her, he uh, hears what you're doing. So you can mix, and you can mix with different people, you can make groups and split up groups, and make groups with other people, and remix music from loops by, by occupying space, wa wandering around, walking around. We will uh, present this. Um, Friday afternoon at Audio Mostly. There will be 23 devices. The 24th went on holiday with a colleague of us. So. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's, it's Cordoba, so we, we, we provide the devices, and it's really fun. Another thing, totally different thing, we thought, okay, um, there's always this server involved. There's always this thing, after all. There's nothing but something. and. The idea was because there were designers in the project too to incarnate this something, this server that may be even a loudspeaker, in, into an object. And there's the, the sure, collective loops with the floor projections, so that became became this lead uh, head of this device. So this is a prototype; it's really existing with the eight loudspeakers inside and this lead thing. And there's of course uh, a computer with a Wi-Fi um, access point inside, so we connect directly to this thing. And we um, implemented a couple of uh, scenarios, and here you have what we call the, the CO909, and you will understand, uh, I think, why. It's a little designer movie. It sounds really not so bad. It's eight loudspeakers, so this thing does some sound. So everybody controls one instrument of a 909. That's all. And it's a lot of fun. And we showed it at, at trade shows, and well, girls are dancing and everything. It's, it, it's really fun. We, we did two, two, different, um, two different scenarios. One is that everybody has a loop, and we did this. Uh, oh, the third one is that um, the collective loops, we redid it uh, on this thing. Totally different. Another project, and then this is, I think, uh, the last one. Um, and it's on Friday. Um, this one is um, the result of a workshop we did uh, at the Music Tech Fest in Berlin 2016 um, under the, the music the, the hack, hackathon or the, this workshop had, had the title Hack the Audience. We thought, mm -hmm, hack, yeah, so we must hack something, so we hack the audience. And um, the idea here is, that came up really with the, uh, among the, the um, participants of your, the workshop, there would be a performer on stage or in the middle of a gallery um, performing into a microphone, you would hear a little bit, there's no amplification whatsoever, you would hear a little bit what's going on, and we would send bits of this sound round robin to different groups of smartphones, and people could play w for around 10 seconds with a piece of 
two seconds of sound with a granular synthesizer, scrubbing and rounding this until getting a new piece of two seconds of sound. So whatever this performer does, you hear a little bit, will end up being a, a granular texture distributed in the audience and nobody has, or uh, anyway, there are 10 different groups of smartphones distributed. So you don't have the same thing as your neighbor. And so if, if the performer would really insist for around 10 seconds to do who, there's really this who all over the place, or you would do this is all over the place. It's a very nice thing, we will see. Um, we have an Indian, uh, a musician from Indian culture playing a sandur on Friday night in the concert of Audio Mostly to do this. I think we could be excited. The thing I'm most proud of uh, is this. I always had the intuition that mobile devices should be a possibility to, to teach music in a way that you are close to repertoire, that you are close to what is music as a recorded thing and as something every the others play. And as something you play yourself and you play with and you understand by playing it. And um, we, uh, we got in touch with the people of the Philharmonie of Paris and they are really very, very gifted pedagogists who work, you really have an incredible experience. I would say Christophe, who, who we work with, you could give him a, a, a matchbox or a couple of mat matchboxes and he would make a wonderful uh, workshop with anybody. And I thought, if he can do that with matchboxes, he can do that with mobile devices. <laughs> and he did that, and it's, it's really wonderful. We have hours and hours of, of images of pupils who uh, perform with Kaya Sayaho materials, which is not the most hardcore contemporary music, but anyway, really contemporary music. And um, the recordings are from the Orchestre, National Orchestra of the Pays de Loire, and, Loire and, and they recorded their favorite passages of the pieces, and the students create their own scenarios, how they want to perform with these materials and recreate music. It's really a super, super stupid um, uh, uh, web app. Web because the, the teacher can just put materials in folders and then they show up first as a menu or where you choose your folder and then you have a list of buttons to start different sounds that are located in these folders that are all loaded. So you start them and then you can have a filter and you can make them faster and slower with pitching or with granular synthesis. That's the application. And I don't have a video here. But uh, it is really amazing to see these young people, their concentration, their dedication to this. They, it wouldn't happen the same thing if you, if you come to a classroom and say, okay, today we listen to Yakai Sayahu, you know, here's it, bam. You wouldn't have the same listening, I'm absolutely sure. Anyway, I can, oh, there's a video. I forgot about it. So we, but we're a little short in time, right? I can have another two minutes? Okay. So. Let's wrap up this a little bit. So I showed you, you know, a, a little part of what we were doing. I, I picked these things to, to really show you different things we did. And um, of course, it's one, one interesting perspective on this is in, to look into network topology. There's a nice paper from Jill Weinberg from, I don't know, from 1910 or something, <laughs> when he was still at the MIT working on stuff that, that we're working on this, at, at the time to, to make an extension of his proposals. So for example, this is like the monks thing. Everybody has a little web app uh, instrument and there is no communication whatsoever between the devices. There's lots of attention, of course, for the other, which is not technical, so it's not written here, but you, you just have these dots in space and, and everybody performs. Or you could have uh, this thing, which is very much like Chloe, uh, in the middle, controlling the sound on people's devices, right? Or you could have this, which is more kind of really application where I do some sound that is on, we did some that's called drops. So we presented the first uh, web audio conference where what I do on my, my <coughs> device would be sent to yours and repeat it and what you do and so on. Uh, these things, and, and, and then it could be like the 88 fingers where everybody controls a common device. So this is interesting, of course, interesting point of view. Another interesting point of view might be this idea of proxemics, that uh, first of all, there's I myself with my mobile, right, this, which is a, 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 an object of interaction design and, and reflection and composition and so on. And then we must consider that I'm in a group 
of people there who I can identify and interact with. In even if we're here, I don't know everybody. I can't see and hear everybody very clearly, but there is a group around me that I can, I know already or not, I can interact with very precisely. And then there is the crowd that we are all, and this crowd is an effect, and we interact with them, and we in interact as the crowd. Um, <coughs> Uh, it, it, it's very interesting to, to look at that, of course. So what we have finally explored, of course, is weapons, mobile technologies with node and everything. We certainly have explored uh, social metaphors of music. Thanks for the keynote this morning. Of course, Christopher, Christopher Small, um, well, we don't have time for the citation today, but uh, did this wonderful uh, uh, definition of music as a metaphor of our lives. Of course, there are things beyond a conductor conducting or beyond looking at rep representatives of a super expert on stage doing music for you. There are so many things, other things to explore. More technically, um, there's this idea of collective affordance and agency that is always kind of a thing to explore. There's these interactions within the group, um, of a group with the environment. Um, this, that idea of emergence, of course, first of all, in 88 Fingers, this emergence of collective organization of rules and topologies that are already there, that are to be completed or to totally to be, to be invented in such environments, which is a matter of composition as well as emergence, uh, spontaneous emergence. And finally, um, I like to look at this a little bit as participation design. Now, participation design is certainly something like collective interaction design, okay? That is one part. But, so here's the point I want to make, okay? So, what I really figured out in these four years, what I'm really passionate about and really like about this, and why I will continue doing this for years, I think, is this, that part designing participation, kind of composing for something where people will participate and interact and where you know, don't know exactly what will happen or do you give them rules or maybe notes or scores or whatever but, but it's them who are the creative ones and you're the meta-creative person um, is very much about the presence of the other. That means, you know, in, imagine doing an interactive thing, you're, you're giving means of interaction somebody is interacting with an installation, this is already something. You do it for the public. There's lots of, lots of that in participation design. You're designing a device, a dispositive, something like this. But the really new thing here is that for each of the participants, they are in the presence of the other participants. And that's the most important thing about it, and that's the most exciting and most challenging thing about it. What is how they are attentive to each other. And that's uh, my message of today. Thank you very much. Thanks. On a more personal, hmm? on a per more personal note, I would like to, I'd like to add that this is my last presentation as somebody who's employed at IRCAM. And I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> All right. If there is no question, they will come up the questions. Yes. I have another person. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. Um, you were talking at the end a bit about what what you learned uh, from those four years, but I was wondering also about the expectations you had when you started the project and with what turned out not to be working or to be working um, unexpectedly good, maybe. Right. I can cite one thing that was really problematic. That was um, that we discovered, I mean, you know, working with Chloe in this context of electronic music, it was really hard for me to realize that people go to these concerts not to to listen to something else than this music that makes them listen very strong, very strongly, and they are not really not in this very context, not at all very, uh, very, very receptive 
to, you know, there were people very much into it, but after all, you know, it was anecdotic in these concerts. It was anywhere worth doing it. And of course we learned just, you know, we will do the same thing in a different context where it's more like chill out electronic music concerts, where it would perfectly work. But this was, for example, kind of, you know, it's not that surprising, but uh, after all, you know, we, it was something really to learn. And after all, what I learned is that, but, you know, in spite of it, the, the weird thing is that we, we could pretend very easily that what we are doing is not just about listening. You know, it, you know, we could easily pretend you go to a concert, oh, you are just sitting and listening, and if you come to our concert, you're really actively doing, doing something, you know, which is, well, you know, a nuance. So. But after all, what we did is creating listening experiences. It's super and totally about listening, like music is always about listening. So we create very, very specific, fragile, beautiful, potentially beautiful and poetic listening situations. And well, you know, is not compatible. And something else, I don't know, you know, at the very beginning of the project, we, we, we it was not written anywhere that, we'll be, that we will be doing everything with web technologies. You know, collaboration was written, their participation, mobile devices, but it was not clear. And all partners, within the first two weeks of the project, decided that we will do everything we can, apart from some details, with web technologies. And I didn't super expect that that will be so great, and it was great. More questions? Um, yes, uh, I was wondering, you were talking about the presence of the uh, audience or the other people, but um, maybe that's also an idea of mine. Maybe it's also the presence of the sound itself. Maybe it also helps to uh, to get the sound uh, to, to um, get the sound more lively because if you are in a situation where also the uh, speakers are only on the front and also a situation where the um, stage is in the front and it's like a hierarchical situation, it distributes, it distributes the sound. Maybe it's also the presence of the, of the sound itself that uh, increases. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even even if it's just, and we, we saw Sebastian Pickmold's wonderful concerts, and even the moments where Chloe is controlling the, the cell phones of everybody, and there's no a lot of agency uh, involved from, from the part of everybody, even the situations where it's just a question of distributing the sound in the space, uh, there's a big potential. I, I totally agree, yes. But, yeah. And anyway, it's, there, it's always a device that is held by somebody, and somebody is there, and, uh, and yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, question or two before the concrete. Oh, I have a super long thing here. Thank you. It's a big present. that what we just did with mobile phones, you know, you don't get funding to do things without mobile phones. You don't get funding to, to make 88 people um, touching a piano. I, I don't know how to do that. I would love to do that. That's one thing. And, but of course it gave me the idea, hey, we could do that without mobile phones too. Right. But, you know, it would be very crowded, it would be a very different situation, you know, people would be there, um, you know, and then we can make a very big piano, but then, you know, there is something something about it that's there, the 
piano is totally evoked, but you, you know, piano is on stage. It's like there is a piano, like there would be, you know, it references very much this situation of a piano concert, even if it's in the middle of a gallery, but that uh, as if there would be a piano player, but there is none. So all of a sudden, yes, it's about the presence of the others, but the presence of the others as a single note. So everything in this case, you know, it's very much about, of course, this emergence of we try and desperately try and fail and fail to do something meaningful together. And, uh, well, you know, it would be really not the same with this. But, but uh, honestly, I think I learned a lot of things that I would like to, in other situations, um, experiment with things without mobile phones. I think, you know, there are other, there are artists like, um, you wouldn't give me a name, there are artists who work with their public and let them do body percussion, so um, don't worry, be happy with his name. Uh, now him, yeah, right. So there are people do, doing this, you know, audience participation things that, that they are totally not with. There were some uh, people at, at IRCOM consider at the moment to, to, to make something in the direction of, the, uh, of having an agency that would propose audience participation scenarios and mobile phones is at the very end of the ideas, you know, there are boards to... I saw something where um, there were uh, um, rap, music, rap singers on stage and people wrote um, words to balls and threw the balls on stage and the rappers spontaneously picked up the balls and rapped, uh, you know, there are incredible things to do without mobile phones. But I didn't compare it. I have fear to compare it. I think it's much more fun. Uh, in the Kaya Sariaho project, uh, I was just wondering what kind of control opportunities did you give the participants? The, yeah, the little snippet you played sounded like unprocessed audio, but I didn't gather what you gave. Sorry, uh, I was very quick about this. There, was, there is uh, a filter. So, uh, so this is I pads, they have a good sound, uh, and then there was a bass player, by the way, it was iPads plus a, plus a bass player to complete the spectrum. And the uh, um, application permits you to start and stop things that might loop or not, as you like, and then you have a filter, you can close and open. We were discussing, you know, should that open and close, or open and close, but I thought it should open and close. And then there, uh, you can move it like this and it would speed up and slow down, either with granular synthesis or with sampling, resampling, pitching. That's all. But of course, the exciting thing is what they did out of it. When you know, organizing themselves, who will play what, and discussing about you know how to make groups out of it, you know, to create compositions. It was amazing their ability to create these compositions. They were students and specialized high schools to, to, to um, learn uh, conducting uh, trucks, you know, not specialized on music and art or anything, for example. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. As a co-founder of this conference in 2015 with my dear friend who left IRCOM before me, Sam Goldschmidt, I have the responsibility to remind you that we don't know yet when the WAC is next year. And with this year, we know that it's an annual conference. It's not one, it's not a couple anymore, it's a series. So, who does the who organizes the WAC 2018? We have a couple of weeks to come up with an idea.